In South Africa, the 15 BRICS summit begins in Johannesburg, where head of state of more than 34 countries met to discuss partnership for mutually accelerated growth. In Sudan, the confrontations between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary quick support forces continue to escalate. The president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, denounced the intention of the far right to spread hatred in the country and continue the destabilization attempts. Hello, welcome to From the South. I am Heidi Maurel from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news, and stay with us. The 15th summit of the BRICS group started on Tuesday in Johannesburg, South Africa, and will conclude on August 24th. The date began with, a, with the business forum with the participation of ministers from participating countries. Later, the leaders of the organization, led by Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, will make a speeches and later meet behind closed doors. 34 heads of state and governments from Africa and Asia, as well as Latin America, are expected to participate in the summit. To date, 24 countries have formally expressed their interest in joining to the BRICS, the summit will address issues such as the dollarization, the entry of new members to the bloc, and the creation of a common currency of their own. On Monday, the United Nations Children's Fund said that more than 2 million children are in need of humanitarian aid in Niger. Before the political instability, UNICEF already estimated that 1.5 million children under the age of 5 were suffering from malnutrition, of whom at least 430,000 were suffering from the deal list from of malnutrition. According to UNICEF, these figures may increase if food prices continue to rise and an economic downturn his families, households and incomes. The UN organization launched an urgent appeal to guarantee access to Niger from humanitarian workers and supplies and ask donors to protect humanitarian funds from multilateral or unilateral sanctions. In Niger, the United Nations spends more than 20 times for money or fuel for generators to prevent millions of raccoons from spoiling due to constant power outage. Niger relies on neighboring Nigeria for up of 90% of its power, but as part of the sanctions imposed by ECOWAS, Nigeria cut off a part of its electricity supply. Most of our approximately 1,300 local health centers in Niger are powered by solar panels and can keep vaccines cold. Like in the capital and in the regional and district levels, they relied on electricity and new generators. A convoy of around 300 supply trucks arrived in Niger's capital, Niamey, on Monday as Burkina Faso came to aid at of its sanctions hit neighboring. The West African bloc ECOWAS imposed sanctions on Niger after army officers to pledge President Mohamed Bassoum in a couple last month. Benin and Nigeria closed the borders disrupting supplies. The trucks sent by Burkina Faso's military rulers, mostly carrying food, were guarded of its armies before Niger took charge of protecting them. The UN's food agency warned last week that sanctions and border closures linked to the political crisis were greatly affecting the supply of vital foods and medical supplies into Niger. Thanks God, Allah brought us home in good health. We left Abidjan, returned to Burkina in Kaya, and the convoy took us to Dori. From Dori, the Niger soldiers took us over to Terra, and from Terra to Niamey. In Hamdoliya, we had no problems. We're very grateful to the soldiers who escorted us. The convoy went very smoothly. They come from Burkina Faso and carry mostly foodstuffs, household goods, and miscellaneous products, like salt. You have corn, you have a certain number of basic necessities on these trucks. In Sudan, conflicts continue between the Sudanese army
and the paramilitary quite support forces. This Monday, fighting broke out around the strategic armored corps uh, in the south of the capital, Khartoum. The far insurgents claim to have seized control of the place, confiscating large warehouses of military equipment. However, the Sudanese army denied the facts and pointed out that the attacks were repulsed. Fighting also continued in Jala, the capital of the South Darfur state in western Sudan. The hostilities that have been raging since April 15 have left at least 300 dead and more than 6,000 wounded, according to figures released by the Sudanese Ministry of Health. On Monday, over 10,000 people, many dressed in brightly yellow, gathered for a climatic choke in support of Zimbabwe's opposition leader Nelson Chamisa prior to tense general elections. The Southern African country goes to the polls on Wednesday for presidential and legislative elections with Chamisa, 45, vying to defeat Haaland, 80 years old head of his state, Emerson Nangagwa. The vote they take in place against the backdrop of discontent as Zimbabwe's economic crisis is being closely watched as a barometer of popularity for the Nasu PF party in power since independence 43 years ago. Supporters of Shamisa Citizens Coalition for Change, CCC, gathered on a partial pilot plot and land in Setra Harare from where the Sanus PF's towering headquarters are visible. The rally was finally to a bristling campaign in which dozens of Chamisa campaign meetings were banned and some of its supporters assaulted by suspected Sanu activities. The trial of the former Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Agustin Matata Ponjo, opened on Monday before the country's constitutional court. The former Prime Minister and opposition politicians is accused of having invested for uh, $205 million of the $285 million disbursed by the Treasury as part of the pilot project. Former governor of the country's central bank, Deo Gratias Tumombo, and the South African businessmen and manager of the company in the charge of the project, Grobella Cristo, are also being prosecuted in this case. On the other hand, the presidential candidate in the coming December elections is contesting the legal proceedings, which he describes as a plot to damage his campaign. During his speech on the Angolan Parliament, the president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canel, honored the relationship between Cuba and Angola, highlighting the unity and solidarity ties between the two peoples. For her part, the head of the legislature, Carolina Cerqueira, highlighted the sense and support of the Cuban people for the defense and the freedom and integrity of the Angolan territory. The head of the parliament underlined the role of the leader of the Cuban revolution, Fidel Castro, who promoted the solidarity of the island, whose memories and legacy remained in the heart of the Angolan people. Likewise, she reaffirmed her commitment to promoting and strengthening the unbreakable political, diplomatic, economic and cultural ties. Let's take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on TikTok account at Telesur English, in which you will find news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, denounced the intention of the far right to show hatred in the country and continued the destabilization attempts. The head of the state warned about new attempts to destabilize the country and gave instructions to strengthen the country's security. At the same time, he reiterated his support to Venezuelan migrants, for which he confirmed an oncoming World Conference on Migration where he will demand international organizations to respect the human rights of migrants. Likewise, he ordered the restructuring of all the state media in order to update them according to national and global needs. Finally, he made a call to all the population to support the institution and protect the country from the destabilization attempt. A 
Ecuadorians voted overwhelmingly in favor of stopping oil drilling from Block 43 in the Yasuni It oil fields. With 92.97% of the vote counted, the majority of the Ecuadorian population voted in favor of keeping the existing oil in subsoil of so-called ETT, which integrates the Ishimko, Tambobcha and Tupini fields. The JAS vote to stop extracting crude oil to got 59% of the vote, while the JAS vote for continued drilling reached 41%. Now, the oil companies will have to dem dismantle the facilities after 10 years of a struggle by the indigenous peoples, defending the protection of this area of unique biodiversity, but the which is also home to about 20% uh, of the country's crude oil reserves. In a historic event in Ecuador, Luisa González, candidate of the Citizen Revolution Movement, has become the only woman to win the first round of her presidential elections so far, after Sunday's election day. With more than 22% of the votes counted, the candidate for the Citizen Revolution with 33.29% with of the votes and will face the right-wing party Democratic Alliance, led by the businessman Daniel Novoa, in the runoff next October 15. Noboa obtained 23.67% of the vote. According to the National Electoral Council, 80% of the electoral roll participated in the election day, in a process marked by the inconvenience registered to exercise the vote abroad. In Bolivia, President Luis Arce outlined the industrialization policy promoted by his government as an urgent need to guarantee food sovereignty. At the same time, an international economist described as successful the economic model that has been implemented in the country for more than 15 years. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, tell us more. Professor Gregorio Vidal from the Department of Economics of the Autonomous Metropolitan University of Itzapalapa, Mexico, commented the book A Fair and Successful Economic Model, The Bolivian Economy, 2006-2019, written by Bolivian President Luis Arce. There have been significant advances and today we are in a context where it is not only a question of continuing to implement the model, but doing so in a context of complexities. Because on the one hand, it is necessary to rebuild what was destroyed in a short period of time when the will of the people was superseded. The Mexican professor stressed that economic models other than neoliberalism are also the result of social struggles and decisions of the peoples, and that the issue at stake is always the distribution of economic surplus. They are always social processes, never market processes. That is the tale they want to sell us. They want to sell us the idea that there are natural processes and those are markets. No, they're never natural processes, they are social processes. And there, in the case of neoliberalism, there are social processes so that the surplus goes to a few. President Luis Arce argued that the current economic model in Bolivia, which he promoted first as President Evo Morales' finance minister, now seeks industrialization, an unthinkable process in a neoliberal government. Neoliberalism had 20 years to industrialize the country, being one of the objectives that were set out. They never did it, and they are not going to do it, because as Professor Gregorio described, neoliberalism and the social elite that takes advantage and profits from neoliberal policies do not represent the Bolivian people, do not represent the most humble ones. President Arce pointed out that even the country's large agricultural producers use imported inputs, including seeds, which is why his administration aims to reverse this trend. The tomatoes that our comrades produce here in the countryside are grown with imported seed. So, where does food security with food sovereignty stand? To talk of security with food sovereignty, we have to produce from the seed, and that is exactly what we are doing. The Bolivian model has been successful so far with economic stability for more than a decade which is evidenced, for example, by an inflation rate of 0.8% in the first half of this year. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. 
We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our website or YouTube channel at Telesur English, there will you be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's more recent events. Find a short break, don't go away. Welcome back to From the Thaus, and now we welcome our special envoy, Junus Sonner, who is in Johannesburg today, with the latest update from the BRICS summit underway in South Africa. Good afternoon from here, from Johannesburg, South Africa. The BRICS summit has started today in the morning, has gathered the BRICS business forum, with also participations on ministerial level. The forum discussed several issues, among them, of course, the matter of de-dollarization and the establishment of a joint BRICS currency or the establishment of direct digital payment systems to avoid the use of US dollar. Other topics on the forum in the discussion were climate change, common response to that, uh, and of course also uh, deepening trade relations, deepening uh, uh, travel contacts, deepening infrastructure cooperation among BRICS uh, members, as well as possible new members to the BRICS uh, alliance. Uh, the, in the afternoon, uh, the leaders of the countries, the presidents, are expected to arrive here at the forum, at the BRICS forum. Uh, to meet up with the business representatives and also to, uh, uh, to, to start their own agenda regarding the summit. We will continue from here, from Johannesburg, to observe how the path, how the summit evolves, the path it takes, the progress it achieves in regards to the de-dollarization issue as well as the expansion issue, the inclusion of new members to BRICS. Yunus Soner, Johannesburg, Telesur. Thank you, Junior. After three years, the first international flight from North Korea landed in Beijing, China's capital. Air Korjo flight is estimated to have arrived at Beijing Capital Airport around 9.17 a.m. on Tuesday. It is official the first commercial flight on the North Korea state-owned airlines since early 2020, after North Korea closed its borders in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Chinese Foreign Ministry had announced on Monday the reactivation on the, of the passengers' air route between Beijing and Pyongyang, operated by Air Koryu. Although the first flights between the two capitals has been cancelled. And we have come to the end of this new brief. You can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok as well. For Telesur English, I am Heidi Maurel. Thank you for watching.